Hi, my name is Andres. Uh, I'm working on Postgres, uh, employed for Microsoft, and I want to talk about how we can get to using asynchronous I.O. and direct I.O. in Postgres. Uh, one part of the problem why we are not using asynchronous I.O. in Postgres right now is that it's a lot of work to get there. And to illustrate that, I've been working on and off on this since uh, 2020, and I've for been doing bits and pieces before on this topic since at least 2015. So the first thing, part is that it's a very long path and uh, that there's a lot of hard pieces to get to. Like a lot of the individual parts are generally hard engineering problems, which also explains why we haven't done it so far. To be able to really talk about all of this, uh, I'll first want to explain a bit some very, very basic things about how I.O. works. If you use uh, buffered I.O., um, which is what Postgres currently does, uh, this is how uh, an I.O. happens. Uh, the application, for example, uh, Postgres, uh, starts doing an I.O., for example, because Postgres got a client uh, select request that needed something from the disk. Postgres asks the operating system, and the, and the operating system um, like asks the disk, and the disk gets the, upper, gets the data to the operating system, and then from there to Postgres. Um, obviously, you have only one I/O in flight at the time, which means that we are pretty slow. We are bound by the latency of the disk. It can be much better if the operating system is uh, able to recognize that uh, we need to do multiple I/Os at the same time. Then you can look like this. Uh, Postgres does one I.O. or it does multiple I.O.s and um, sends them to the operating system and they all get processed at, at the same time. With current devices uh, like NVMe, SSDs, they can do many, many I.O.s at the same time. If uh, the, because I said that this is how it happens when buffered I.O. is used. Uh, so if the operating system already has the data cached, then it looks instead like this. That is, uh, Postgres starts I.O., but uh, because the operating system already has the data cached, it can instead just use that cached data. The operating system will, in that case, copy the data into Postgres's uh, memory uh, shared buffers. Uh, the even better case, obviously, is if Postgres doesn't have to do any I.O. because all the data is cached in Postgres. A buffered read uh, an individual buffered read works like this. The application asks uh, the kernel to do I.O. That first goes and checks, gets checked in the kernel page cache, which caches all the kind of data, uh, like, IO, like file data. And then if it's not that present there, uh, the kernel sends a request to the drive, and the uh, drive then copies the data into memory. And that copy, importantly, does not happen by uh, uh, like the CPU. There's dedicated hardware for copying that kind of data. And during that time, the CPU can do other things, uh, which then also means that the CPU needs, needs to get notified when the I.O. is done, and then that the drive uh, requests that or interrupts the CPU and tells it that the data is now finished. And then the data that's been now exists in the page cache can now be copied to the application. One of the important things is that this copy here from the page cache to the application is actually fairly uh, CPU intensive and it has to happen by the CPU. And that copy alone can be the entire bottleneck for your, uh, for sequential scans or other similar things. In contrast to that, when we do direct I.O., the application still asks the kernel to, uh, for the data, but the, the page cache is not checked for the data. Instead, the I.O. is directly sent to the drive and then the drive does uh, this uh, hardware copy into the uh, requesting in memory uh, with this efficient special case hardware again. And, but this time, that happens directly into the application memory. And uh, because of that, all of the copying can happen with dedicated hardware, because we don't have this intermediate stage of the, sh the page cache. And that can be much more CPU efficient. I said that uh, we've been working on adding asynchronous I.O. to Postgres for a couple of years. Uh, one of the first pieces uh, that we did that 
has been added, has been worked on by Thomas Munro, and that is uh, to do prefetching of IOs during uh, crash recovery or streaming replication. Now you might ask, why is this part of asynchronous IO? The reason is that um, if you do not have the ability to re prefetch uh, during wall, uh, crash recovery, and you're using direct IO, you can get into very, very, very bad performance because uh, like crash recovery is a single process doing IO, and if there's lots of cache misses in shared, from shared buffers, all those, that, that means we do a single IO at a time, uh, and we have to wait for it to complete, which means that you're completely bound by the IO latency. Uh, and you very easily can come up with scenarios where what crash recovery can never uh, keep up. So what Thomas introduced was that we can do explicit prefetching of data that will be, soon be needed during crash recovery or uh, other forms of wall replay. This does not actually do asynchronous IO or anything. Uh, instead, what it does is um, ask uses the operating system facility. Wait, wait, Dave. We ordered the slides of accident. The slide got lost, sorry. Um, it uses uh, the operating system F advice call to read the data into the page cache, and by, because of that, we can rely on the data being present uh, later. But it, the way Thomas wrote it, it's very easy to later converge to explicitly using asynchronous I.O. Uh, one, another feature that I worked on that we already merged and that I worked on uh, and th that is very important for asynchronous I.O. support is to make uh, relation extension be uh, done in bulk. Until now, we, ha uh, we basically, or until 16, we extended a relation one block at a time. And the reason this is very relevant for asynchronous I.O. is that um, you get, if you use direct I.O., you would get a very, very fragmented file because just about all the file system, if you do direct I.O. and extend the file by one block, they will like, allocate exactly one block from anywhere on the disk, and then you do another I.O., and there will be yet another place on the disk, and they will not be together, and you get a file that consists out of arbitrarily many or uh, small chunks, and you get horrible performance, even on a good SSD. The other reason this was a good product to tackle uh, earlier on is that as a, it, to be able to do bulk uh, relation extension, we needed to build a lot of building blocks uh, that we also are going to need to do uh, asynchronous AO, because one of the fundamental requirements uh, when you do asynchronous I.O. is to be able to have more than one I.O. in progress at the same time, obviously, because otherwise you're not going to gain anything. Um, and for that, we need to be able, we needed the facility for that, because until now, uh, Postgres never needed to have one process doing multiple I.O.s. So uh, the bulk relation extension also needs that, because we need to be able to uh, have shared buffer entries for all these blocks that we're extending at once for concurrency reasons, because otherwise we can potentially uh, read, have data read multiple times without, like, can lose the rights and similar things, which would obviously be bad. So it provided a lot of the, it, it provided the opportunity to implement a lot of the uh, features that we were going to need from the buffer management perspective and do so before, and benefit from that before we get to like actual using AO. To uh, show you some of the degree of which this bulk relation extension can help. This is doing copy into Postgres where the data fits into shared buffers. And the blue line is um, 16 just before this, the, the set of commits that added bulk relation extension. And the orange line or red line is just after. You can see that at the very smallest end, there's a tiny bit of performance benefit of doing bulk relation extension. But after that, uh, it scales much better but that at some point we stop scaling and uh, get even slower. And the reason for that is that we hit a contention point that is un independent actually from the extending relations is the free space map, which Postgres uses to find unused space. And it turns out that w at some, that point we just end up with lots of processes trying to use the same free space and they are just contending. And uh, if I just disable in the code, the use of the free space map, it ends up scaling much better. I also did that experiment with uh, the code from before, but there's basically no difference. 
if, oh, one important detail was that this was into an unlocked table, so there were no wall writes. If instead uh, I do it into a logged table, uh, the results don't look quite as good. We still gain a fair bit of scalability, uh, but it's not the same degree. Uh, and the reason for that is that we are just content now being bottlenecked by our infrastructure for doing wall writes, and that's where the bottleneck is. And this is also why uh, here the disabling of the free space map does not actually gain us very much because we are just bottlenecked by something else. And another feature that has been added to 16 is that we actually now support direct O, except that you really never should use it, <laughs> with very, very few exceptions. It's basically been added to bu start building the infrastructure in Postgres to be able to use direct O. Uh, we have, at the moment, it's because of that named uh, debug IO direct, but uh, you can set it to either the wall or wall uh, in it, which we use the uh, direct O for the wall writes or creating new wall segments. Um, you can set it to data, uh, and we, when you, where it uses the direct O for normal I.O. for of in data files, and it will be horribly, horribly slow. Don't ever <laughs> just do that in production at the moment. They, it can actually be okay for the wall, because we don't have the same issues because most of the wall writes we do are already synchronous. So like making them more synchronous can, won't actually hurt that much or at all. Uh, and in some cases you actually can see performance gains today with it. This is the set of things that we have so far emerged. Uh, there's lots of other smaller things, but they're not that interesting. So now we come to the, part, the next steps. And what you're planning to do next, and which uh, Thomas Munro has submitted the patch for, is to introduce uh, an abstraction for doing streaming reads. And the reason for that is that um, if you want to use asynchronous I.O. in a lot of places, uh, if we use the lowest level interface to, use, to do asynchronous I.O. in all of these, it's going to be a lot of code that needs to control how far ahead do you read of the current point. Um, how many IOs do you want to have in flight at the same time? And it does not make sense to litter the whole uh, executor with code to do this. So instead, we added, uh, like, uh, I wrote an interface to where that makes it much easier to do as, uh, as use asynchronous IO from uh, various places in the code. Um, what Thomas then did was to or what Thomas recognized was that we can actually utilize the same interface even without asynchronous I.O. The benefits will be much, much smaller because we cannot actually do real asynchronous I.O., but we can avoid, like we can make the, make, uh, provide some hints to the operating system that we can read data ahead, like that we can use F-advice to tell the operating system to read data, and uh, that already provides a small, some small speed ups. But the main goal really is that we can start converting parts of the back end to do use asynchronous, uh, to use the streaming read interface, which then when we actually introduce asynchronous IO, we can, those will all automatically uh, already support uh, AO uh, because asynchronous IO, like we can't, if you, we just introduce asynchronous IO, nothing in the, co the back end will actually use it. So we need to also introduce users of asynchronous IO. Uh, we also have a similar uh, interface for streaming writes, but it's not yet clear whether there's enough point in introducing that before the main uh, asynchronous IO interface. Uh, one thing I forgot to say earlier, the, your, the slides are linked from the talks, so if you can't read anything or something, you can get them there. The URL also will be at the end displayed. The next step after that will be to introduce the main asynchronous I.O. interface. What you're currently planning there is to have uh, a few different backends for asynchronous I.O. One will be just workers, to use workers to do I.O. That will not actually be proper asynchronous I.O. from the hardware or operating system perspective, but uh, we need to have an, the ability to use asynchronous I.O. from the Postgres perspective even on operating systems where we do not understand how to drive asynchronous I.O. because 
there's just too many operating systems that we support and too many versions of operating systems, so we won't be able to use asynchronous I.O. everywhere. Uh, and on platforms where that's the case, we have uh, worker support, which where we just use uh, n, a configurable number of workers that can start uh, asynchronous I.O. in the background or by doing syn many synchronous I.O.s in each worker, or doing synchronous I.O. in n workers and then just providing the illusion of doing asynchronous I.O. And that actually still provides substantial performance gains. So even on operating systems where we won't have the support, uh, it still does help a fair bit. On Linux, you can use I.O. Euring, which uh, can provide substantially increased I.O. performance because uh, it can do a, a real I asynchronous I.O.s. So you can have many more I.O.s in flight than you would ca could have with a worker-based approach. We also wrote uh, support for using POSIX I.O., which is like the standardized way to do asynchronous I.O. in POSIX. It does not work all that well, and barely any platform has a good implementation of it, but it was interesting to support it so we could make sure that the abstraction layer was actually generic enough to uh, support this. We have also have a halfway working uh, support for using the native AO support in Windows, uh, but it never passed all tests, so we haven't actually merged it. And n none of us works really much natively on Windows, so it is all a bit complicated to debug this kind of stuff via CI and similar things. Uh, with this merged uh, on its own, it, nothing uses AO, so it's just a boring uh, infrastructure piece. Um, now I'm going to talk about the conver some of the conversions to using AAO. Some of them you can actually introduce before uh, the main AAO interface is introduced because we, it uses this streaming read interface that I mentioned earlier. The first uh, thing that really makes sense to convert uh, is sequential scans. Right now, uh, we just use the normal read system call to read the data in and the only reason that does not completely crater is that the operating system will typically do read ahead. And that provides like enough reads in progress at the same time that we can often, but definitely not always, utilize the full hardware capabilities. Another problem with uh, using the normal operating system interface with via buffered IO is that you often can end up with lots of double buffering. That is, the, you have the same data in the Postgres page cache and in the kernel page cache, which wastes a lot of memory that you could use a lot better by only caching data once. For that, to avoid that, you need to use direct IO. But if you were to use direct IO today, uh, you have only one IO in progress at the same time, which means that your performance will be completely bound by the IO latency and typically be extremely, extremely slow. Another problem is that even if the operating system does do read ahead, uh, it often gets confused. For example, if some of the data in, is already in Postgres of shared buffers, from the operating system, it will look like there's kind of random I.O. and it will not stop doing prefetching. Or if the Postgres splits up the data into one gigabyte segments, and at the end, whenever we switch to the next segment, the kernel doesn't know that this is the same read process, so it starts doing very minimal prefetching and has to first ramp up. If you plot the throughput of a sequential scan, you have this weird pattern of like being slow, getting faster, slow again, getting faster. And obviously that's uh, quite wasteful. And it's with the streaming read already, uh, interface already added, it's uh, a few dozen lines to add, add this uh, support. To show the performance effects of this, um, the, this is just doing a sequential scan of a 12 gigabyte table and uh, plotting how, for how long that takes. And you can see that on master uh, it takes quite a long time, and this is because the operating system cannot be made, like basically is never aggressive enough in doing read ahead. So because the latency on is uh, too high, so we would need like many megabytes of uh, read ahead and progress at the same time. And the operating system just doesn't do that aggressive enough, even if you configure the read ahead uh, KB or whatever it is on Linux very aggressively. Uh, in contrast to that, with asynchronous IO, uh, we are much, much faster. Um, and very interestingly, this is true 
there is very little performance difference between asynchronous I.O. and direct I.O. here. And the reason for that is that the bottleneck now is not just elsewhere. I had disabled uh, doing parallel work, parallel sequential scans here, because that would show something else. Um, so the bottleneck is just not there. Uh, in contrast to that, we also have a patch uh, to convert PGP Worm, which is a tool to populate shared buffers with data from disk uh, to the streaming read interface. And here you can see that um, there's a pretty significant difference between asynchronous I.O. and di direct I.O. Um, and that is because now the CPU overhead of this copy that I had mentioned earlier is the actual bottleneck. So we can get, we do that much much faster. And if you were to actually have a, uh, even when doing the sequential scans, if you had a machine that was CPU bound workload wise, the direct AO would be much faster. So on a smaller machine or on a with lots of parallel sequential scans, you actually see a pretty significant difference between di using direct AO and not using it. The next uh, conversion is to uh, make check pointer and background writer uh, use asynchronous I.O. This is actually uh, converting the background writer to asynchronous I.O. is kind of how I got started to work on asynchronous I.O. Postgres has a background writer, but that just writes back data when it thinks that uh, Postgres, like the individual backends might need clean buffers soon. It doesn't work all that well, and I was starting to work on it to try to make its algorithm better and then found that even if I make it very aggressive and choose exactly the right buffers, it couldn't really keep up to do, doing enough writes because all of the writes that it does are typically random writes and it, the operating system just didn't allow enough write uh, concurrency uh, for it to be able to keep up with busy workloads. Uh, to show how much uh, using asynchronous and particularly direct O can help, this is the time to checkpoint uh, uh, 35 gigabytes of dirty data uh, onto disk. Uh, uh, sorry, how many megabytes a second we can do uh, with a, in a checkpoint. And you can see a pretty decent gain from uh, master to using asynchronous I.O but a much, much bigger gain to using direct I.O. And the reason for that is that the kernel page cache basically cannot do more than a 2.5 gigabytes of writes a second. After that, the CPU overhead of uh, just managing large amounts of uh, dirty data in the kernel is just completely bottlenecking you. So, and there's very, you can make that less bad by giving the kernel hints that it needs to write data back in specific points, but that gives you perhaps like a few more like a, a fifth more performance or something, not much more. And so this is particularly a workload where we probably need to use direct AO. It might very well be that we should introduce a configuration option to use direct AO for check pointer and background writer, or perhaps just all writes, but still support doing uh, buffered I.O. for reads, because if you do not want to dedicate a machine to using uh, for all the memory for Postgres, it will be beneficial to uh, be able to use operating system cache for that data, but because the throughput loss of throughput for writes is so high, it might often be useful to configure it so that uh, writes are direct I.O. and reads not. The next big thing would be to convert uh, wall writes to using uh, asynchronous I.O. Um, to explain why this is particularly useful, um, this is a plot showing how many times a second, or how many IOs a second we can do in the way that uh, wall, write, wall writes are written. That is, we either do we do, an, uh, we do one IO and then we have to flush uh, that I like, make sure that that IO actually has reached the disk. That is, like we either have to call a data sync or we have to use. An, uh, a, spe a specific flag for opening files in a way that every write is automatically made durable. Uh, and on uh, this storage device, you can see we, there's not a whole lot of these that we can do each second. Like it's, I think, about a thousand that we can do because each uh, AO is, has a latency of roughly one millisecond, which is like pretty low actually for cloud storage. Um, we're just limited by the latency. 
But on that same storage, if we instead start to have multiple IOs in flight at the same time, we can do many, many more uh, IOs at the same time. And that would theoretically allow us to get much higher uh, throughput uh, for OLTP type workloads. It does not matter as much for uh, bulk data writes because there we can do just do much bigger IOs at once where the latency does not matter much anymore. Yes, one second. Even though I just showed that we currently can, or just said that we can currently only do one IO at a time for wall writes, this is less bad than it might seem immediately because Postgres ha uh, does a form of group commit uh, for all wall writes. That is, it doesn't just flush one wall, uh, the right one transaction to disk at a time, but if there's other transactions waiting at the same time, they all get flushed together at once, and that can give you much higher uh, total throughput in a concurrent workload than just w the one IO at the time might suggest. To explain, it's, however, pretty hard to actually efficiently use uh, asynchronous IO for this. And one part of the problem is that uh, typically OLTP workloads in real transactions only have a relatively small amount of writes. And in this case, I looked at PGBench, which is like close to the worst case uh, for optimizing, for having many writes in progress at the same time, because each transaction only does about 500 kilobytes of writes. And one page of wall is eight kilobytes. So a lot of transactions actually fit onto the same wall page. And we cannot have multiple IOs in progress for the same wall page, because then we would get like, we wouldn't know which of those writes actually reach the storage, and we just would end up with a complete mess from the storage perspective, and read back like a mix of those two writes, or even get consistency errors because we corrupted some drive level checksum. So that would not be good. So we only can have each of those eight kilobyte blocks, one of them, uh, it can only be written once at a time. So whenever we flush, we actually might be able to fit more data onto the previously written page. So we have to wait for that IO to finish, be finished first. There's a trick around that, which is that we could actually just, instead of using the trying to use the space that was on the last page that we partially filled, we can just say we fill it with zeros and declare it to be just boring data, and then start uh, writes at the next uh, page. Here is uh, the benefits with the code as it currently stands. You can see that uh, there's a small difference between using AO and uh, head, and it's actually making AO look bad, and this is mostly because the AO branch has more instrumentation in this code path. But then if we do padding, we get, get better performance, uh, a decent amount, but it's not definitely not utilizing the full powers that we could do with multiple IOs. And this is mostly because uh, we need to I still do work to make the wall code in Postgres actually be able to schedule in the writes more efficiently. And I've gotten, mostly gotten it working so we can do this more efficiently and we end up uh, benefiting more from this, uh, even at low client counts. I forgot to say that this is only for one to 16 clients. If we go to larger client counts, we see already uh, benefits, some benefits from using AO because that's where we actually start filling two pages. Uh, so we actually have like the, be the potential to even uh, schedule more IOs at the same time. Another thing we can do, and I think we should do, is to change the default wall block size to four kilobytes. Four kilobytes because that's a typical block size of, uh, from, of hardware. Um, and we are currently basically increasing write bandwidth a fair amount by constantly rewriting the same page over and over. And uh, a second part that I want to uh, definitely get into 17 is like a statistics counter that counts how much data we, how much write bandwidth we actually using for the wall compared to write a certain amount of bytes. So we can uh, measure the write amplification. With uh, some more changes that are not yet done, we can get uh, at least 50 to 2x, uh, like zero, like can 
roughly double the performance, even for PG Bench. But because it's currently only kind of working and doesn't pass all the tests, I didn't feel like we can, I can really present that as actually working numbers. Another thing that hugely benefits from using asynchronous I/O is vacuum. And the reason for that is that uh, we have to read a lot of data, and then we have to, to write a lot of data at the same time. And we can only write the data back after we've done uh, flush the wall for th that covers those, that, that amount of data to disk. And currently, that often leads to having to wait for the wall write, then having to wait for the disk, for the data file write, and then only reading the next block. And you end up completely ba being bound by the I.O. latency. And you often can see that if the data is not already in shared buffers, that uh, a full, like an unlimited vacuum that doesn't have any cost limits or something applied, uh, ends up not being CPU bound or anything. It just goes bound, completely bound by the I.O. latency. And uh, to showcase this uh, on a higher latency cloud disk, uh, I measured vacuuming uh, some relation that I created. And on master, it took like 94 seconds with A.O. Uh, not even direct A.O., just A.O. It took 12.3 seconds, and that was just because we could actually do multiple things at once. Uh, we could start the writes, and to be able to start the writes before that, we can do the, the wall write in the background, and once that wall write has completed, we can start doing the data file write in the background, and because of that, we are now CPU bound. Um, on a lower latency cloud disk, we, uh, on master, uh, the same table takes uh, 33 seconds to vacuum, and with um, AO, it's 7.7 .7 seconds. The fact that um, there's still a difference between the lower latency and the higher latency cloud disk suggests that the scheduling we do for asynchronous AO was not yet perfect, because we were not actually bound by through, by, we were not limited by the bandwidth that we had we were just not fully able to utilize uh, the available bandwidth because the scheduling of AOs was not perfect. And we also don't use AO for quite everything. For example, the uh, commit, time, uh, commit SLIU does not use direct AO and has very small buffers. It's very typical to actually be bound by the uh, cost of doing the commit lookups, like looking up whether some, the XID assigned to a tuple has actually committed or not. There's, uh, in the AO tree, there's other, a few other uh, parts of the system that has been, have been converted to asynchronous I.O. One of them is process sync requests, which probably does not tell you very much. What that is, is that at the end of a checkpoint, we need to call fsync on every file that we have modified during the checkpoint. And right now, that just happens synchronously. We do a one by one by one by one. And that often can le be very substantially slower than doing many of those in parallel, because doing many of them in parallel can actually combine one uh, flush request to the hardware between multiple files being f-synced, and that can get very substantial performance improvement. Another uh, I kind of mentioned already in the as part of the uh, vacuum work, um, we can write back date buffers. Uh, write buffers back in the background, and particularly do so when we try to acquire new victim buffers. A victim buffer is when we want to read new data into shared buffers, but there's no f unused buffers, so we have to first uh, reuse one buffer, but for that, uh, because there's already contents in that buffer and it's already, it, like, it's dirty, we first have to write that buffer back. And the ability to do that in the background uh, can so be very valuable because you, it's typically, but uh, you encounter this when you know backends try to read some data and they first have to write data, and you end up seeing like that backends do a lot of writes, and doing that in the background can help. Another thing that where it can help is to when when Postgres has crashed, we have to uh, synchronize like call fsync on parts of the data directory, and that can take a, lot, a fair amount of time, and we can do that in, uh, using IO, and it's faster. It turns out that since 
I wrote the patch or the part of the AO work to do this, we have a better solution. So I might drop this because we now have the ability on Linux at least to use SyncFS, uh, which does this for the whole file system at once. So you might only need one or two of those calls because we, if you have a table space or the wall directories on uh, a different uh, file system, but that does it all at once. That's typically much faster because you don't have to iterate over the whole uh, directory tree. Another uh, thing that we can very usefully use AO for is uh, bitmap peep scans. Bitmap peep scans, we already have some support for prefetching data, but we only prefetch data into the kernel page cache and then from there into uh, Postgres uh, shared buffers. And uh, that means we still have to do the C that, that AO, sync, like the mem copy from the kernel page cache uh, synchronously. And that is not great for performance. These exist. There's, however, a lot more features where we should be able to uh, use AO for, but where we just have not done the work. One big benef uh, part that would benefit would be to use AO for uh, index scans. The, particularly when you use direct IO, it would, can be, would be very bad if each of those uh, IOs would be synchronous because you're then completely bound by IO latency. Um, but often we can actually do better because we know, for example, that uh, we will visit the next block in the index uh, or we f are fetching multiple heap blocks uh, or tuples from multiple heap blocks that are referenced by one index entry or one index page. Uh, there's some work ongoing on this that is independent of the AO work, but that should be able to uh, be converted to using the AO uh, framework uh, to make this more efficient. There's a lot more around vacuuming than we can make faster right now. We had just converted uh, the main reading, reading of the main data and the vacuuming as part of for B-trees, but all the inde other index types don't uh, use AO, and some of them actually have very adversarial um, I.O. patterns. The, there's code in the B-tree, the B-tree tries to doing vacuuming to do I.O. somewhat sequentially, but some of the other index types don't, can't do that, or, or we haven't made it work, uh, where, which then leads to I.O. being much more beneficial. And there's just lots of other pieces that we could convert. Oh, uh, one restriction is that right now uh, I.O. cannot be used for temporary tables. And the reason for that is that when we use workers, uh, that means we would need to access file descriptors that are currently only ever opened in the backend that access a temporary table because the, the workers have to do that I.O. somehow. And just, that seemed very problematic for, somehow because it, it could lead to that file descriptor being open uh, uh, when we want to delete or truncate the table and on some, some operating systems that does not work reliably and uh, other related problems. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank that, like lots of colleagues that have worked on, with me on this, uh, different pieces here have been written by different people. Uh, I think I mentioned uh, that the streaming read interface that we have been submitted was written by Thomas. Uh, David has been uh, submitting like smaller prerequisites that weren't quite interesting enough to be mentioned here, but were still very critical. And uh, Melanie has been working on some control algorithms for how far we have to prefetch and some of the conversions for doing AO. Uh, other people in the community have been working on interesting pieces. For example, Thomas has been, Tomas has been working on doing index prefetching. Uh, Barat uh, has been working on using the wall buffers for streaming the wall out. One of the problems with using direct AO for the wall is that we often want to also read the wall, for example, for archiving or for streaming replication. Um, while it's a lot faster often to use direct AO for the wall, um, if you then need to read it from disk, that might not be worth the cost. So uh, instead, what you can do is we can stream it out of the buffer that we have in memory of uh, some of the wall data, and then only fall back to reading it from disk if the uh, 
wall receiver or the wall senders are the clients are too far far behind, which then like reduces the potential overhead that might introduce. Uh, Heike has been helping with reviewing some of the pieces or some of the prerequisites, which has been very helpful and like some of the infrastructure work that he's lately been doing is actually very useful to be able to use AO in more places. One of the places we don't currently use, the patch that doesn't use AO is um, for any of the data, access, data file accesses that do not go to, through shared buffers. For example, um, doing index creation, we write directly to disk, uh, or and sometimes also read data directly for disk. If you rewrite a table, uh, we also sometimes do that, and there's a few other places, and now there's an inter a proposed interface for unifying all those accesses into one spot, which then would make it much more feasible to use AO there. Yeah, that's uh, my presentation so far. If you have any questions, please go for it. I think it's no. hello. Um, so using direct IO sounds like it would need uh, very large shared buffers to be efficient in Postgres. How good, well does the current clock, clock sweep buffer replacement mechanism keep up with very large buffers that you would need there? Does that destroy some of the effects? I don't think the clock sweep is particularly problematic. Um, there are other problems, so um, particularly. Uh, when dropping tables uh, or truncating them, we currently do a linear scan through all of shared buffers. Uh, and if you have uh, shared buffers uh, of, I don't know, half a terabyte or so, that can actually take a fair bit. Uh, and if you imagine workloads that have like do regression tests or something and constantly create uh, drop tables, that actually you can end up spending most of the time doing that. Um, that's already a problem today, so that's one of the reasons why sometimes if you run regression tests against Postgres, it can actually be much faster to set shared buffers to the absolute smallest value. Um, that's, I think, the biggest issue that I've seen. Um, yeah, I've done many gigabytes a second through um, Postgres with huge shared buffers, and the clock sweep shows up, but not as the primary bottleneck. I think the problem there is more that once you have a very large machine with multiple sockets, you actually want to do the clock sweep in a NUMA aware manner, but that's more about uh, where do you then do the, that you get buffers that are likely on your NUMA node or something like that. Uh, and that I think, but I think that's, we can easily defer that for quite a few years, I think. Yes. Um you mentioned uh, three different uh, types of uh, AIO that you would uh, were planning to implement, worker, uh, POSIX, and IO Uring, if I recall correctly. Mm -hmm. um, are there any specific constraints uh, for or against using any of those? Because I have not read specifically up into IO Uring, but assuming that every backend needs to register all the buffers as I/O pools. I expect that to be a significant uh, additional registration pool. Uh, right now, the IO Uring backend does not register buffers. That would be a bit faster, uh, but it would. You normally would hit uh, limits for that the kernel sets for how many buffer you are allowed to lock lock into memory, and it gives you a performance benefit. But it's not like a huge performance benefit. It's a few percent, so it just did not seem like a crucial bit. Um, the their POSIX AO provides has some limits uh, on different operating systems. So on macOS, for example, where it's the only real AO interface, uh, the number of AOs that the default configuration allows is I think four, <laughs> which is pretty much useless. I didn't understand why you allow it at all if you just allow four. Um, on Linux. They, it does, the way it works is to start threads, uh, which means that it's pretty much never a good idea to use it. It's just some standard compliance minimal implementation. Um, so it, it might very well be the right choice to not use it. Um, I think on Windows, to be able to use 
real AO, you have to use direct AO. So the restriction there would be that it could only really benefit if you use direct AO. Hello, uh, is it meaningful to use such option when working with virtual machines? Can you, sorry, can you repeat is that? It, is it useful to configure asynchronous or direct I.O. when your progress is on virtual machine? Yes, uh, several of the numbers here that I showed were actually taken on virtual machines. Uh, the more important, like the more relevant part is whether what kind of storage your virtual machine uses. Uh, if, you, if it is configured to use some sort of cloud storage where like the network, that you have a network hop in between, you typically get see extremely large benefits from using asynchronous AO because the latencies are so much higher. So much surprisingly, if you have uh, local SSDs inside the guest, uh, inside the host, uh, that's often, and particularly when you have bandwidth limits or IOPS limits, that's perhaps where the benefits of using AO are the smallest because you already can easily reach those limits that you are allowed to use from the VM. Uh, so you can't really get much further because you can easily reach either the IOPS or bandwidth limits, so it doesn't help to use asynchronous AO. But that's just when you have like low limits. Hi, uh, have you noticed in any cases where say a vacuum uh, floods with requests uh, that somehow increase the latency for a smaller query? Uh, maybe a, you know, a small selector, inserter, something like that? Or has that not been a bit of a problem? I mean, the limiting should work pretty much the same as it does right now. Uh, but I'm sure that if you are currently completely latency limited because you constantly do the wall writes, that if you are not doing that anymore, you might move where the bottleneck is around and where they truly, truly could help. But like then if, you try, if you're not intending to not use all resources, then you probably need to configure the, the cost limiting. Um, I'm sure that there are some cases, like because if you can do many more like bulk data load at a much higher rate than before, then you're going to potentially overwhelm the system with that. But I think we can actually provide, currently we don't do that yet, we can provide a lot more control about like which, how much IO we are allowed, each type of workload is allowed to do. Um, right now we haven't focused on that yet. We have time for more. In that case, thank you very much, Andres.